Hello everyone and welcome back to the long-awaited second episode of my single-player survival series. I know you had to wait quite a long time for the second episode. This is because the, work the workload for school is a lot higher right now due to Covid and I wanted to focus on my exams. But now that they are all over I have a lot more time to play games and I should be able to get episode 3 out sooner. That said, let's get into it, shall we? As you might have seen in the intro of the video, I made a raid farm. The one I made is Double Moses' raid farm. It's a simple, efficient and sturdy farm and is perfect to start with. Obviously, I will be designing my own farm in the future, but raid mechanics are not my strong suit, so I opted for this design as a temporary farm. I will be explaining the mechanics very briefly, but for a full and excellent explanation, please do watch Double Moses' video. Underneath the farm there are villagers who are placed in specific locations. These locations are chosen so that raids spawn in the location we want. This location is far above the player, that's AFK. The illager beast will be killed with lava and the other raiders are all funneled into a stream and kept there for a while. Once the raid bar has run out, the raiders are released so that the patrol captains can give you bad omen again to start a new raid. To start a farm, you simply go into a hole of the farm with the bad omen and the raid will automatically start. You can also leave some captains to start the raid again when you need more resources. This farm has produced quite a bit of resources, a big amount of emeralds, which is the main loot of this farm, but also quite a bit of gunpowder, redstone dust, sugar, spider eyes, bows, and as much totems of undying as I could ever want. Seriously, look at the amount of bows and totems of undying, it's just ridiculous. This array farm was obviously built with a purpose, and the main incentive is of course the emeralds I get from it. These emeralds have been used to trade for tools and armor in my makeshift trading hall I'll be showing next. With my auto villager breeder, it was pretty easy to fill up the villager hall, though it was still a very laborious task to find out which uh, villagers had the right traits. It took me a few hours, I think. But luckily I didn't need to search for good prices since my uh, trading hall takes care of that part. The trading hall has everything you could want. It has all the diamond tools, weapons and armor traits, as well as the books to enchant them with. Farmers for example are not present in the trading hall since they've been made obsolete by my new raid farm. Yay. If we go outside, you'll see that I've traded quite a lot. In fact, I've traded for a shulker box of diamond armor, tools, etc. All of these are, are located here and will at some point be enchanted with these books I've collected. The most important thing to enchant was the pickaxes for the digging project, so naturally I prioritized those. I have already enchanted about two or three, I think three, Shulker boxes of um, diamond pickaxes. Maybe you've already spotted it, but since the last episode I upgraded my armor and tools to netherite. I also have a not so insignificant amount of netherite tools in my inner chest. Now those diamond pickaxes were rather simple to gather with my villager trading hall and my raid farm, but gathering netherite was not so easy. To gather this, I crossed a bunch of TNT to make a very long tunnel in the nether I could fly through, searching for netherite. Obviously, a simple TNT duping tunnel bore was not an option since I don't dupe anything in my single player world, so I needed to craft all of the TNT.
I crafted a few shulker boxes of TNT using the gun probably from my general mob farm and a bunch of sand that I mined in the desert far away from spawn, which I designated to that purpose. After doing this, I could bomb away and collect the netherite. Later on in the process, I realized that the ancient debris wasn't all too visible, so I also made myself a texture pack to make the ancient debris a bright pink color with a green border, which made the ancient debris very easy to spot in these netherite tunnels. After a whole afternoon of blowing things up and mining netherite, I was able to gather about 8 stacks of ancient debris, which I then entirely spent on netherite pickaxes and netherite shovels. I'll have to do a whole bunch more netherite gathering in the future if I want to make the rest of my armor and tools netherite too, but that's a task for later. For now, I have more than enough to be focusing on more exciting projects. One of these more exciting projects is my winter skeleton farm. I've been mining a lot in the perimeter and I have as you can see already set up a decent storage for the resources. The items have to be sorted manually though, since an automatic nether storage is a bit of a pain because you can't use water to transport the items. It's not that bad though since the block variety is that big so it's not that much work. I've mined quite a bit with a little over 200,000 blocks mined. The amount of blocks I got from this is already quite substantial. I broke some best bedrock to designate the chest slices to a certain block and I used chunk boxes to store them. Once the box is full I can replace it with a new one. I also have some fire crockets and potions here. The fire resistance potions will be used when, when I'm bucketing away the lava and will be pretty useful in the future. Even though I already mined 200,000 blocks, there's only a few layers mined. The progress isn't going as fast as, as I had hoped, and this is because of one unforeseen factor. In the base of Delta, where I chose to make this perimeter, magma cubes have a very high chance of spawning. When we look at the code, we start to see just how ridiculous the spawning rates for them are. Only ghasts and magma cubes can spawn in basal deltas. Magma cubes dominate the monster spawning with a weight of 100 compared to the 40 for ghasts. This means that a little over 70% of the spawn attempts will be for magma cubes. But not only do magma cubes have a big weight, they also have a pack size between 2 and 5. This means that on average 3.5 magma cubes will spawn for each successful spawn attempt. This means something needs to be done. Mining is almost impossible when you get constantly attacked by those pesky little fire slimes. Luckily, there is a solution. We just need to stop the magma cubes from spawning. And this can be done by using a mob switch. Hopefully, after building the mob switch, progress will speed up significantly and I can finish this perimeter in no time. So, how am I going to make a mob switch this early in the game? Well, there are only two options right now, either zombie villagers or shulkers. We can't really use withers since the wither skeleton farm obviously isn't finished. I chose for shulkers since this will be the easiest option because I use respawning shulkers from carpet mods. Though, by no means will it be easy.
As you could see, I started by clearing an empty city. After that, I made a long railway so I could transport the 70 shulkers I need for the mob switch to the end portal and into the overworld. To gather the shulkers, I made this little shulker collector, making use of respawning shulkers. This box was completely spawn proofed, except for the floor on the inside. The shulkers can only spawn there. I also have some rails running through the box to collect the shulkers that have spawned. Then, when the shulkers are collected, they can be transported over the railway to the end portal. The shulkers try to teleport quite often, but since they can go nowhere, they just end up teleporting to another place inside the box. When we arrive at the end island, I think you'll immediately notice a few things. I've spawnproofed the area around the end portal. This is to make the shulkers teleport underneath those pistons I've placed. I have also made sure that there is nowhere for the shulkers to teleport to underneath the portal. When a shulker arrives, the following will happen. First, the activator rail will kick the shulker out of the minecart. Then, the shulker will be a bit confused for a few seconds, but eventually it will realize it has to teleport and that the only place to teleport to is underneath the pistons and they will te teleport there. Finally, I can use one of those buttons or that le lever to activate the pistons and push the shulkers to the overworld. But because Minecraft is Minecraft, the shulkers don't always cooperate perfectly but it is more than reliable enough for a one-player mob switch. So, now I'll get myself a shulker to give a little demonstration and show the entire system in action. The shulker is on its way. Ah, uh, there it is. Now, you see that the shulker was kicked out of the minecart, but it was placed onto those rails. As I said, the shulker is a bit confused. If you look closely, you'll even be able to see part of the rail inside of that shulker. It can take a while though until the shulker realizes that it needs to teleport. Sometimes it's only a few seconds, but it can also take 10 or 20 seconds. The shulker has finally teleported, but is nowhere to be seen. This is something else that happens occasionally. The hitbox of the shulker must collide at some point with the end portal to make it go through the overworld. But this doesn't always happen though. This time we don't need to use the pistons. Now, let's go take a look on the other side of the portal. When testing the system, quite a few shulkers have already gone through, as you can clearly see. I always put them inside boats so I can transport them quite easily to the nether. There is also a boat with two shulkers in it. This is a little bit special because one of the shulkers is inside the boat sideways. What I think must have happened is that the shulker collided with the boat when going through before positioning itself on the ground and thus it went into the boat sideways. I am not 100% certain yet about the design of the nether mob switch. What I do know is that it's gonna be a lot of work, a lot of tedious work. The shulkers don't count towards the mob cap when they're in Minecraft cards anymore, like they did in 1.15, so I'll have to design something in which they can teleport and can shoot each other, and that's not gonna be easy to put them inside that contraption either. There's one last thing I also made, it's nothing special, but I do want to show it to you. It's a bitter color. I did make it in the wrong spots first. It needs to be under a full 3x3 cube of bedrock. And I made the hole in the wrong spot at first. This is a correct place. I made an obsidian shape to put the soul sand on and an obsidian wall to hide behind so I don't get damaged from the blast. This is the place where I killed all my withers, so I could use them in the beacons for the perimeter. 
So, that was it, all the progress I've done so far. I really hope you've enjoyed it, and if you did, I would very much appreciate it if you subscribed or leave a comment with some feedback. Maybe you liked it, maybe you hated it. Please, let me know. Finally, I will explain why it took me so long to make episode 2. People in my Discord server already know all of this, so if you want to know the latest news, make sure to join that. The link can be found in the description. I have been really really busy with school. It has been especially tough with the pandemic going on and I haven't been able to play, record or edit as much. My exams have finished though, so hopefully the next episode will release a bit sooner. If you stuck around till now, thanks for watching and I hope to bring you episode 3 somewhere in April.